The darkness looming over, down to my last few bullets and nursing along my last bit of battery power. The trees rustled and quaked, the music pondering away, the wonderful atmosphere so thick and palpable. My last battle had left me hobbling away. I was tired, scared, and really wondering where my cardboard cutout had gone. I wanted to put down the controller and switch off the TV. The tension was getting too much. At any moment, I'd be set upon by far too many enemies, and I wouldn't be able to hold out with my current supplies. But then, through the gloom, a shack with a small blinking light, a radio, and by it supplies. I switched on the radio while I fill my pockets with as many batteries and bullets as I can find. Hope. At last. And through the radio crackles the voice of Pat May. Well, I was just outside for a breath of fresh air and what a night. I, I know most of you are probably in your beds by now, but if you're still up and around, take a moment. Step outside for a spell and breathe in deep. Mm, the weather is absolutely still. The sky is crystal clear. It's like the forest is quietly breathing along with you. Moments like these is what made the Alan Wake experience so vital, so alive, so true, and create such a deep and personal connection for all of us early fans. It was my first scary game, I was playing it far too young, it was almost too much for me at every turn, but Pat's little radio calls were a light in the dark for me, and have become one of my absolute favourite parts of the whole experience. And then Alan Wake 2 finally comes along, and I was so excited. I even messaged Remedy and the Alan Wake Twitter asking about Pat, if we would get more late night radio shows, but I got no answer. I held out hope, and then we finally got more of Pat in Alan Wake 2, but... Sorry for the late start on my today's program. I, I took a little hike to clear my head, and, and you know that this fresh mountain air really does wonders. But, I just, I just couldn't seem to find my way back. I know that trail like, like the back of my hand, but it, it, it's somehow different now. Everything's changed. I'm starting to feel like I'm the only one who remembers how it used to be. All I kept thinking was, I need to find my way back. Find my way back. Pat just isn't the same. Pat's show as a whole is just entirely different. He has a sort of manic energy rather than his voice being a safe haven of sorts in the dark. I found it now to actually be a point of stress listening to him talk, of confusion. I was shocked, I was really thrown for a loop here. Pat was a sort of forgotten main cast member, rarely discussed by anyone unless they were a super fan. He was like a commonly held favourite character for many of us an easy to miss gem, and here he was, lost, confused, as the whole world around us was growing darker and more twisted and more lonesome. Nothing was right here. It had to be the darkness, be the evils at foot here. No. The final radio hour with Pat makes it abundantly clear that Pat is suffering from dementia. Nothing spooky, scary about it, right? Yet it is one of the most terrifying aspects of the whole experience. We experience firsthand the horrible, diminishing effects of dementia as Pat slowly drips away from us. I find it really interesting the discourse as to whether it is supernatural effects or dementia affecting Pat. He is someone that we hold so dear and so close that there has to be a different answer. It has to be something that can be undone. It has to be the story affecting. I don't think that at all. This really hits home when I found him in the nursing home. Gone from his prior studio in the first game, now a desk and audio equipment in the nursing home. He's just, he's just like me. It's heartbreaking, it hurts, and I felt robbed. One of my favorite parts of my game, one of my favorite characters, my Pat, was hardly there at all. And that barely holds a candle to Cynthia Weaver. Cynthia, 
Cynthia, Thomas and Barbara are the three main backstory pieces at work in Alan Wake. She is a hugely vital character and shapes much of our knowledge around the Dark Place and Zane that we carry forwards. She is the Lady of the Light, an absolute beacon, that last homely house. She is our saviour when the game reaches its darkest point and without her, there would not have been any way to beat the darkness in the first game. But how do we find her now? She is referred to mostly as the Hag. She too is greatly diminished, but by the forces of evil now. Once the Lady of the Light, now she isn't even given the decency that Barbara was given. She isn't evil and conniving, dark through her speech. No, she is a flailing, screaming, horrific monster. More beast than human. This is the Lady of the Light. What is Remedy doing? They are destroying their legacy characters. You're setting up a third game, but who is even going to be in that game if you kill off so many of your legacy characters? This isn't even bringing up Mulligan and Thornton, two of the main comic relief characters in the first game. Brought to life so much in this game, made proper, major characters. They are two of the most twisted and depraved characters now, used so creepily and so darkly. The treatment of legacy characters is so brutal. They've taken so much from me, my characters, my, my, exactly. The feeling of being robbed is so palpable, it's so present. Mulligan and Thornton are robbed from me, robbed from us, robbed from the story, from the narrative, from having a satisfying character arc by the darkness, by the evil at work. Cynthia is robbed of her legacy, of her role as a hero. You can never look at her the same way again. Her presence in the first game is now tainted. So is Mulligan and Thornton's radio signals. And so is Pat's. But shouldn't a sequel do that? Shouldn't, as we learn more, as the story grows and proves, shouldn't it inflict new meaning, even if it's a cruel meaning, on the old work? I'm once again reminded of Salem's Lot. Spoilers for a latter part of the book. One of the main characters is Father Callahan, one of the most powerful characters, a constant source of strength in the story. He is a priest and the only character the main villain fears because he has the power to banish him from the town. So he meets Callahan, planning on having a one-on-one -on -one duel, the full strength of darkness against the full strength of light. The entire book, Callahan has been looking for an opportunity to prove himself and his faith. He is an old man of God. He doesn't understand modern Christianity. He believes in a God of fire and justice. And now we have him going up against the big bad. It's the big moment. There's only like 20 or 30 pages left of the book, if I remember. This is it. Callahan pulls out crucifix and tries to banish the vampire. The vampire named Barlow laughs and says, I'm paraphrasing here, but he says, you are a shaman of the God of the universe, not the God of crucifixes throw it down and face me faith to faith but Callahan can't throw it down and as he grows more fearful the power of the crucifix fades till Barlow takes it from his hands and breaks it in his last moments his faith failed the faith his entire character was built around Barlow then makes him drink his tainted blood vampire blood cursing him and sends the priest out of the city to live a cursed existence. His entire character arc, his world, his life, his faith, it all fails. And it is a gut punch like no other. The reader's entire world is shaken and all hope fades. This is the power of such a gut punch character arc. I've utilized this technique in my own Stephen King inspired audio drama. The Ever Pleasant Mr. Bates. It sounds both like in other podcast places. I'm not just saying this to plug it here. I'm using it as proof of my love for this concept, of my respect for it, that I've used it in my own writing. It hurts. It ruins everything. It takes so much. But Father Callahan is one of my favorite characters. It's so much fun to see our favorite characters succeed, to win, to beat the bad guy. But that victory needs to feel earned. It needs to feel like a fight worth fighting. The cost needs to be great. And when a character fails, when they break, when they are robbed, it sometimes makes their character so much more. Suddenly there is so much more to relate to, to connect to. They become so much more human. 
That's what took Pat Mee's radio hours from such a special handful of moments in Alan Wake to being one of my favourite. Because the ride doesn't last forever. The calls we hear with Mulligan and Thornton are now so much more impactful in the first game because we know where it ends. And I'll be honest, I never really cared for Cynthia Weaver. She was just a plot device. But now, when I play the first game, there's so much more there. Cynthia's story is all the more important because we now know it costs her everything to do that for Alan. And it's taken Mulligan and Thornton from being comic relief to showing all characters have their own darkness and evil. And it's turned those few moments we get to spend with Pat into vitally important scenes. They aren't little cassettes we can skip over like in every other open world game anymore. They are just as important as every other major cutscene. And that is the power of killing your legacy.